You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Good morning and good evening from the East West Center in Washington. My name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East West Center and the Director here in our Washington program. Welcome to this first in a series of three seminars as part of our United States Republic of Korea cooperation in Southeast Asia Visiting Fellowship Program. Uh, we have an upcoming series of three programs built around the work of our outstanding fellows under this program. And today we begin with a program on creating smarter and more sustainable cities in Southeast Asia, a roadmap for United States Republic of Korea cooperation. And for this program, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome one of our uh, fellows on this inaugural year of the program, and that is C. Young Sarah Kim. Um, she is currently a PhD scholar in international uh, cooperation at Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea. And we have as a discussant, very privileged to have uh, Ms. Helen Santiago Fink. And she is with the State Department's uh, um, the, the U.S. ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership and has been doing uh, a range of work uh, across the federal government, given her expertise in urban issues, energy, environment, on smart cities. So it's a perfect dual and combination of expertise. And um, today's program, we're going to have uh, a 30-minute presentation from Sarah on the research she's been doing as a visiting fellow under this program. And then we'll have some comments and um, uh, issues raised by Ms. Santiago Fink. And with that, let me begin the program. You have fuller information on their biographical details in your invitation materials. Thank you for joining us both from Seoul uh, and in the US or wherever you are given this uh, virtual program. And uh, we'll move to Q&A after the completion of their uh, initial prepared remarks. With that, welcome. And Sarah, over to you. Good evening to you in Seoul. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. LeMay. Um, before I begin, I would just like to express my um, sincere gratitude to the East West Center, um, all the staff and the Korea Foundation for the support that uh, you've all provided me throughout this research. And of course, Ms. Santiago Fink for her time and serving as a discussant for this event. Um, I've already learned so much from our previous conversation and I really look forward to discussing this issue with you later following the presentation. Um, smart cities overall is a handful of a topic. It deals with so many issues ranging from the environment, energy, transportation, data platforms, and my presentation provided the limited time is only a partial take at the topic. Um, but I really hope that it will help incite further discourses on smart cities in the future. So I will begin. Um, as indicated in the table of contents throughout my presentation, I'm just going to provide um, an overall background on the importance of smart cities, the establishment of the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, um, explain how external actors such as the US and South Korea are helping to promote um, ASCN um, efforts, and finally provide you three key recommendations for bilateral cooperation on ASEAN smart cities going forward. Um, so to begin, I think as a starting point for smart cities, it's important to highlight the backdrop considering um, the global environment and its related developments. And while there have been so many grave challenges for the past year, including the COVID-19 pandemic, the year 2021 was also significant in that the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, declared a code red for humanity in terms of environmental concerns. And world leaders um, who have signed the 2015 Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding international treaty on climate change are making domestic efforts to reach this net zero emissions target by 2050. Um, the COP26 meeting that was held last year also paved the way for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So in considering all of these global efforts to address climate change, 
I would now like to bring your attention to why Southeast Asia as a region is especially important for climate change mitigation efforts. Well, for one, um, according to reports, Southeast Asia is considered, quote unquote, the world's most vulnerable region to climate change. And with a vast community consisting of both maritime and continental states, um, Southeast Asia has an extensive experience with natural disasters, such as floods and typhoons. All ASEAN member states are also um, currently signatories to the Paris Agreement, and they have developed various cooperative frameworks for combating climate change, including the ASEAN Ministerial Meetings on the Environment and the ASEAN Working Group on Climate Change. And among the various issues that are underlie climate change, urbanization is a particularly big problem, both globally and regionally. So at large cities account for only 2% of the world's land mass, but 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is huge. And it's actually predicted that more and more of the global population will join the urban masses, um, including those in the ASEAN. So as currently, around 50% of the ASEAN population reside in cities. And Southeast Asia really does need stable and sustainable cities as they are the economic drivers of the region, contributing to around two thirds of Southeast Asia's um, overall economic growth. So in considering these circumstances, there are numerous solutions that are being implemented by different states, but many countries now, nowadays are developing and investing in so-called smart cities. So what exactly are smart cities? Well, if you search for a single definition, um, it will be very difficult. There are so many different definitions for what a smart city is, but largely they refer to digital knowledge-driven cities that utilize the internet of things and other technologies to improve the overall quality of life and ensure better sustainability. So as shown in the graphic on the right, um, smart cities can really extend to encompass various projects from carbon recycling, smart grids, wastewater treatment, smart transportation, digitalized healthcare, et cetera. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but as you can see in these following um, graphics, the revenue for smart cities on the left globally is projected to continue increasing um, throughout the next couple of years. And similarly on the right, um, you can see the different divisions, um, the market segments that underlie smart city efforts, including healthcare, infrastructure, education, security, and mobility. In terms of Southeast Asia, um, ASEAN established the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, otherwise known as ASCN in 2018 with 26 pilot cities. And under this network, um, the cities themselves have sort of the chance to pursue city specific action plans. And they also engage in twinning programs with different cities from more advanced nations abroad to exchange ideas. And by placing the cities themselves at the forefront of the cooperation, research finds that ASCN is beneficial in terms of dodging state or provincial bureaucracy and helping to move relevant projects um, forward faster. And this is just another graphic to show you an overview of the different smart city projects that have been initiated under the ASCN, including um, smart city uh, energy, smart environment, transportation, and IT projects. And going back to the point on how smart city initiatives are carried out on a city basis, one great advantage is that each city is able to point out specific focal points cater to their, um, its development. And for instance, for Kaching, uh, Malaysia, important initiatives include those related to transportation, whereas those for Vientiane, Laos, um, the focal point seems to be health and well-being, um, as well as infrastructure. But of course, there are also limitations with um, ASEAN smart city efforts. And while the cities do have the benefits in having increased authority to lead their individualized smart city projects, there's also this problem with um, appealing to donors themselves. So researchers note that there is also an overall lack and of political will um, among these ASEAN members in driving smart city projects because of their relative novelty and due to an overall sort of disorganized division of labor um, among the different sectoral bodies. So these limitations call for 
um, an enhanced cooperation with close dialogue partners uh, like the United States and South Korea. And so to go into that part, um, in terms of external assistance, both the US and South Korea have been doing so much uh, to provide support for um, the ASCN. And on this general outlook, an overview of the US and um, the US ASCP's efforts, uh, Ms. Santiago Fink, I think will further elaborate on them after my presentation, but just to briefly go over them, since 2018, um, the US ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership, USA SCP, has been this integral part of the US Indo Pacific strategy, as you can see on this slide. And under the US ACP, um, there are currently around 20 smart city projects in the ASEAN, and they're all together worth around 10 million US dollars. And during her visit to Southeast Asia in the previous year, uh, Vice President Harris also emphasized the importance of smart cities under the new Biden administration. So you can see these two slides. And um, also the US has been actively promoting engagement among businesses and corporations. And I believe that um, Ms. Santiago Fink will also talk about this as well. Um, but what I want to emphasize with regards to the US is that smart city cooperation with ASEAN would also be beneficial for Washington as well. Um, because it would help to fortify its own overall domestic strategic vision for smart cities, which many experts see as lacking. Um, in particular, cooperation would also provide platforms for testing out different smart city solutions. And um, the US can also provide a more responsible alternative um, to Southeast Asian counterparts for smart city development, especially considering China. And this points to how China is currently pursuing around 500 pilot projects um, in Southeast Asia, some of which are listed on the right. But Beijing has been criticized for building them without much concern for the general environment. So for example, its smart city project in Johor Bahru, Malaysia was criticized for causing marine pollution. So in that way, the US could provide a more respectable and um, responsible alternative for smart city cooperation. And shifting gears over to South Korea, smart city efforts in ASEAN are closely integrated with its new Southern policy or NSP, which aims to further connect South Korea with its Indian and Southeast Asian partners. So one important development has been that since the COVID-19 pandemic, the N N NSP has been upgraded to the NSP plus um, as of November, 2020. Uh, and this is to address wider non-traditional threats, not only including the pandemic, but also climate change. And with this NSP plus, South Korea also emphasizes green growth with a digital focus, um, something that it wishes to pursue in the long run by brainstorming ways to achieve sustainable economic development and also further advance its AI and 5G technologies. And within the NSP agenda, smart cities and the improvement of infrastructure are currently listed as priority projects for cooperation. And in terms of the specific cooperation that South Korea has with ASCN, South Korea declared its official support for the network in 2019. And since then has established a ministerial level consultative body for sustainable cooperation. Um, and in, a, in addition, it's also signed multiple MOUs with different ASEAN member states, including Singapore and Vietnam. And this is just a brochure that the South Korean government has on its existing smart cities cooperation with ASCN. And I just wanted to show you how there are so many different projects that are listed under smart city cooperation with ASEAN. Um, and as in the case of the US, South Korea's assistance can be largely grouped into two aspects. So there's this financial aspect with different ODA fundings provided unilater unilaterally, such as through the ASEAN Korea Cooperation Fund. Um, there are also multilateral means of funding um, via uh, like the Green New Deal Fund, as well as the Green Climate Fund. Um, in addition to financial, uh, the, the financial aspect, there's also the technical aspect because South Korea is considered to be one of the earlier pioneers um, in smart city efforts dating back to 2006. So 
I'll elaborate on this a little bit later, but one of South Korea's key domestic projects include the development of the Incheon Free Economic Zone, such as the city of Songdo, which is located in the coastal area of South Korea. So cooperation with ASEAN also provides South Korea valuable opportunities to export its own um, know-how and expertise on smart cities. And due to the wide ranging nature of smart city cooperation, there are various governmental bodies, research institutes, private corporations that are invested in these efforts, which further emphasize how South Korea is involved in pursuing technical, educational, and business-based outreach towards South Southeast Asia through smart city cooperation. And I guess one, one of the primary concerns with South Korea's smart city efforts um, addresses the general future of the new Southern policy with the upcoming presidential election in March. But um, different MOFA officials that I have spoken with have been very optimistic that these NSP efforts will continue despite the change in administration. And now um, off to the really important part, which is on US ROK smart city cooperation in Southeast Asia. And before I begin, I want to emphasize that bilateral cooperation in association with the ASEAN Smart Cities Network is relatively new. So there haven't really been a great many number of projects to date, but what I really aim to do in this section is, as the title of my presentation suggests, provide sort of an overall roadmap for future cooperation using existing information. So my research also hones in more on um, the existing South Korean efforts as well. And I'm just hoping that Ms. Santiago Fink will also further expand on US domestic efforts um, to get go along with this part presentation. So please bear those things in mind as I make my way through this section. So first things first, South Korea, along with Japan, is a key international partner for the US on ASEAN smart city building. Um, and as I mentioned, both ROK and US smart city cooperation with ASEAN is relatively new. And currently the one project that the two countries have listed officially as a flagship project um, is the one in Tam Ki City, Vietnam. And this particular project is being led largely by COICA or the Korea International Cooperation Agency with an overall budget of around 11 million US dollars. And if you look at the concept note that COICA has for this project, there is an overarching focus on capital and technology transfer with an emphasis on data management as well. And data management refers to you know, dealing with administrative data collected on residents, traffic, the environment, um, and it also addresses potential development of an e-government data platform. And then in addition to these like state monitored projects, there has also been cooperation at a more institutional level. Um, and last June, Stanford University established um, its Smart City Research Center in Songdo, South Korea, with the main objectives also being um, to improve data collection, um, visualization of different technologies and um, to integrate sensor data. And I want to first discuss why data management has been so prioritized in South Korea when engaging with external partners on smart cities efforts. And to do that, I need to discuss Songdo, which is where this new Stanford Research Center is located. And if you recall, I also mentioned in one of my earlier slides that Songdo serves as a key coastal smart city project in South Korea. And a part of the reason why is because Songdo is one of the most integrated operations command centers in Korea. Um, and it has this G tower that overlooks and monitors the traffic temperatures and is also in charge of sending emergency alerts to the public when um, there's danger or a natural disaster. So the fact that Songdo is a part of this Incheon free economic zone and is also located near the Incheon International Airport um, also aid the city in having wider access to data. So with exemplary smart cities like Songdo, South Korea considers data management to be one of its key strengths. And other studies um, too have a shared focus on big data. And this is a figure taken from a study based on South Korea smart city projects in Namyangju, but it also similarly highlights how important it is for smart cities to be able to 
collect data on things ranging from basic population characteristics to air quality, humidity, um, and such so that natural disasters could be avoided and citizens could be provided better quality in life. And in South Korea, there are various technologies that exist, including the SafeNet system, which have been implemented to provide alerts um, related to public safety and also help arrange response measures through a com common command center, such as the one in Songdo. So overall, while there are not yet many smart city cooperation projects between the US and South Korea in terms of um, its sheer quantity, Going back to the fact that ASEAN member states are very vulnerable to natural disasters, um, for my research, I thought that data management and monitoring technologies um, from the many, many projects that underlie smart cities could serve as meaningful initial focal points for the two countries and working with ASEAN. South Korea also, when I spoke with um, individuals from MOFA, does consider these technologies, including um, smartphone applications for information sharing with the public to be some of its um, signature projects in the long run. And these technologies have actually been um, already been outsourced to some ASEAN member states. So for example, if you see the figure here, countries like the Philippines, Laos, and Vietnam are already using some of South Korea's flood forecasting systems. Um, so there's both existing infrastructure and domestic endorsement um, in this data management direction for South Korea. And after having talked a little bit about some of South Korea's existing infrastructure and projects um, comes this very important question, right? So why should the US and South Korea actually cooperate on this? And one of the reason is due to, of course, an access to wider and more advanced technologies. South Korea launched its um, first indigenous geostationary weather satellite in early 2019, um, but it hasn't been that long since the satellite has been in orbit. And with US assistance, um, I believe that the data access could be further stabilized in monitoring ASEAN coastal areas, temperatures, et cetera, since the US has access to more advanced satellites. There actually is an existing project, which is called the K Water Project, um, conducted jointly with South Korea and NASA for water management and water disaster prevention. And this project is also in cooperation with other ASEAN member states in the Mekong region. So the K-Water project shows potential for furthering similar cooperation efforts beyond just this one project. And it also fits in with Washington's um, increased emphasis on working with the Mekong region as well. Another reason why US ROK cooperation is necessary um, is because the two countries, and this includes Japan as well, frankly, um, are more than just partners, but they're like-minded partners. And this is important in terms of data management and cooperation as the issue itself is pretty sensitive. The US, for example, may have these advanced technologies, but maybe not as much experience in actually collecting and utilizing public data due to personal privacy issues. So in that manner, South Korea and Japan have more expertise in dealing with public data. Um, so a recent example has been the debate surrounding the digitalization of COVID-19 certificates, which has been institutionalized in South Korea for some time now, but not yet in the States. So as like-minded partners, by focusing on data management under smart city cooperation, the US and South Korea can also um, look to strengthening bilateral cybersecurity cooperation. And this also calls to attention um, to how the first US ROK ICT cooperation committee was held in August last year. And so looking back, um, what I hope to do throughout this research is basically connect different dots, um, existing policies, projects, proposed agendas, to see how we can basically narrow down focus areas for delivering tangible output in US ROK smart city cooperation in Southeast Asia. And from the various sources that I have reviewed, I identified this overarching demand for disaster and resource monitoring in Southeast Asia, which ties in then with the US ROK supply and technology and capital, and also with their comparative advantages in technology and data management. It's also important to mention that data management monitoring technologies are areas where 
cooperation will not necessarily begin from scratch, but instead build on existing projects such as those in the Mekong region. And these projects, of course, are in tandem with the global trend and emphasis on technology in light of the fourth industrial revolution. And by narrowing down key projects for delivering more tangible output in such a manner, um, I believe that it would help to move smart city cooperation more forward and draw more public attention. Um, because a large part of the problem, I think, with smart city projects is that um, the lack of overall lack of public awareness. And maybe hopefully this presentation has at least gotten some more people interested. But in that aspect, act actively communicating um, developments on smart city cooperation with the public, I think will further aid its sustainability. And there's also the pandemic and related drawbacks, as well as the upcoming election in South Korea, but I really want to stay hopeful that cooperation will continue on. Finally, because smart cities, have, as you've seen, are is so wide arching among different sectors, including climate change, infrastructure, foreign policy, etc. There is an overall need to improve intercommunication um, among the different sectors uh, to better manage funding and division of labor. And with all of these considerations in mind, I just wanted to end with uh, three main policy recommendations. So my first recommendation is to improve domestic coordination among the different sectors, governmental bodies and corporations dedicated to smart cities, as I just mentioned. And Ms. Santiago Fink and I agreed when we were discussing earlier um, that this is a recommendation that's very basic, but it really cannot be stressed enough. And because smart city projects underlie the climate change division, foreign policy division, infrastructural division, transportation division, you name it, um, it really requires careful coordination first domestically. And this is crucial in terms of actually monitoring the project's developments, as well as how the funds are sourced and used. The second um, recommendation that I had was that the US and South Korea need to actually come together, brainstorm and agree on some sort of an overarching roadmap for approaching um, smart city cooperation with ASCN instead of maybe moving on a city to city basis and agreeing to cooperate on individual projects. And for one, I think um, focusing on key geographical areas would be a good starting point. And in that manner, I think the Mekong region would be a great focus area as it's um, especially vulnerable to uh, resource and disaster management problems. And above all, has already has existing projects with both the US and South Korea um, in, uh, in these areas. It's also important to mention that South Korea also has many smart cities like Songdo that are located along its coastal regions. So there would be much for the different actors to discuss and exchange. And finally, as I stressed numerous times during my uh, presentation, I believe that a part of, as a part of this future roadmap, it's not only important to highlight key geographical areas, but also agree on certain key projects that can deliver tangible outputs, including data management and monitoring technologies. Um, this is because Smart City itself is such a grand and long-term project. And to provide that initial push or momentum, um, the US and South Korea really need to outline areas where interests do align with capabilities. So again, these are the three broad recommendations that um, I would like to end on. And thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. That was a terrific presentation, very clear recommendations. And as we are seeing in some of the Q&A that's coming through the chat, there are some uh, very interesting questions, including from a colleague uh, working on the Smart Cities EU uh, effort. So we'll get to those. But before we do, we're delighted to have from the State Department, Ms. Santiago Fink, to offer some comments and perspectives uh, on the presentation and on the overall topic today. And then we'll uh, move to Q&A. Please, Ms. Santiago Fink. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Kim. And thank you very much to the East-West Center for the invitation. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss um, smart cities um, and the work of the US-ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership. 
allow me please to start with um, the perspective or in a, in a sense, maybe a, a basic definition that we take in terms of our approach to smart cities. And we like to take uh, to define as smart, sustainable cities, um, given where we are globally and the demands that we have at the um, subnational city context. A smart, sustainable city, um, by our approach, is one that embraces a holistic and integrated and circular economy uh, perspective, employing clearly innovation and ICT to bolster planning policy and investment towards creating a more sustainable, resilient, resource efficient and equitable, healthy quality of life. This very much aligns with the initial ASEAN Smart Cities Framework that was developed back in 2018 by Singapore and all the um, 10 ASEAN countries. Keeping in mind, technology is but one tool that is used to shape a smart, sustainable city. It is essential to have the foundational elements in place through participatory urban planning, policy development, and prioritized investments for creating sustainable infrastructure and a green built environment. Without these in place, then overlaying a city with different technological applications, sensors will not reach the ultimate goal of an equitable, healthy quality of life. A smart, sustainable city aligns very much with the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, in its need to provide clean, accessible drinking water, proper sanitation, ensure health and well being, quality education. It needs to be able to provide affordable and clean energy, as well as promote sustainable economic prosperity and promote innovation. Support climate action and resilient systems and work in partnerships to address many more urban challenges. A city in a sense is a microcosm of the challenges the world experiences and very much of the 17 SDGs. The US ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership launched in 2018 works in strong partnership across the US government with our different agencies, including the Department of Transportation, our Department of Commerce, the National Science Foundation, the Bureau of Oceans and Environment and Energy, as well as our national labs, among many others, and is vested at approximately 10 to $13 million in over, 10, in over uh, 20 to 23 uh, projects across the ASEAN region, as um, we include the, uh, the investments made by our other agencies besides the State Department. Let me give you a couple of examples of some of the uh, work that we are doing um, in the region. We are largely vested in the transportation sector and looking to move forward uh, sustainable transport through a peer-peer -peer city model mat matching of US and ASEAN cities to learn from common challenges and to improve traffic congestion, health impacts, expand transit and mobility choices and design better curb management, as well as looking at better using public spaces to improve safety and pedestrian mobility. We're working, one example right now is um, we have five of these, what we call city pairings in the transportation sector. One is uh, between Penan Penn and the city of Boston. We have a similar model in our water program, which is looking to uh, partner US and is partnering US and ASEAN water utilities to optimize water resources, improve water security, increase treatment of wastewater, promote systems integration, and strengthen operational sustainability and resiliency. An example of cities working together are Johor Bahru and Washington, DC. We're very proud to have our first in-person delegation from um, the Malaysian um, group of Johor Bahru. They uh, initially attended our um, water and environment conference in person in Chicago in October. And then they subsequently came to Washington DC to work with DC Water, the water utility in this area to focus on technical cooperation. Our health program is another example of the programmatic activities that we have um, with ASEAN cities. 
Our health project is collecting city level blood pressure data and cross tabulating it with air pollution and arterial fibrillation metrics to assess the core mobilities of COVID and to strengthen local and national health systems. We have a numerous other programs, but for the sake of time, um, I will continue in my um, points to identify where we see some of the important trends within smart cities. And one of those that we are working on is promoting the circular economy principles and systems integration to focus on resource recovery and reuse and to enhance resiliency um, and the strength and ability of critical urban systems, particularly um, very much seen in these times of pandemics. Um, our integrated urban services program is currently now identifying two pilot cities within the ASEAN region that will look to strengthen their food, energy, and water systems, and to be able to um, optimize their use of energy in terms of delivering these services, as well as to extend the reach and to optimize the resource and recovery and reuse. Also, the Smart Cities, um, the ASEAN, the US ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership funds US ASEAN University partnerships to catalyze urban innovation. And this has resulted in digital applications to provide real-time data, both to flooding and traffic circulation as well as in the development of nanocomposite cells to generate renewable energy in biking infrastructure in Kuala Lumpur. These innovations better support and better speak to um, the benefit of partnerships. And these are opportunities to be able to strengthen those partnerships and replicate and scale some of these urban innovations that we have developed throughout the ASEAN region, particularly um, with our National Science Foundation. Also, the US ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership is increasingly uh, working closer with our dialogue partners, as Ms. Kim identified. We work very closely um, with, um, uh, obviously, um, the Koreans um, in our dialogue and our discussions that we've had um, throughout this year and in previous years, as well as with our Japanese partners, our Korean partners, our Australian partners, um, and new partners that are actually joining and taking interest in the Indo-Pacific region. We are uh, very much welcome opportunities um, in the areas of waste management, of eco-innovation, of industrial symbiosis, and other issues that help advance the sustainable development and climate action within the region. The region is amongst the most vulnerable to climate, and we've heard this already from Ms. Kim. ASEAN cities are facing incredible threats um, in terms of extreme heat, also in terms of uh, um, urban flooding and uh, the natural disasters given the um, climatic changes that are experiencing in the region and throughout the world. The number of cities that are gonna be impacted just in terms of urban inundation by 2050 will reach 36% of um, urban environments in the region. In addition, the region is one of the um, world's global um, biodiversity hotspots. And keeping that in mind, this is more um, initiation and pressure for the region as well as um, the partners and the donors working there to be able to help advance the climate um, agenda, as well as the biodiversity agenda that very much works in tandem. It is uh, critical to be able to preserve the biodiversity hotspots with um, the challenges of deforestation that are happening in the region. And unfortunately, they are among the highest um, deforestation that are happening across the globe. Just in the past 15 years, the region has um, average approximately 1% annual loss of its regional forest cover. Um, continuing to where we can cooperate, the areas of um, air pollution in the ASEAN cities are among the highest also um, globally and far exceed the uh, World Health Guidelines. Large cities like Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh, Jakarta have among the highest um, air quality 
standards, but we're also seeing significant increases among smaller cities like Vientiane and Yangon. The US Indo-Pacific Economic Framework pursues our shared objectives in the region, including those of digital economy, technology, resilient supply chains, as well as decarbonization, clean energy, green economic recovery, and investments in sustainable infrastructure and other priorities. These are areas primed for cooperation and investment among our many dialogue partners, and specifically um, with the Republic of Korea. The scale of renewable energy in Southeast Asia has been limited and can very much benefit from greater market choices and cooperation to allow our ASEAN cities to move forward in embracing clean energy. And let me conclude by saying eco-innovation and research and development to catalyze a green economic recovery is critical in this time as we're coming um, and addressing challenges of the pandemic. It is essential to help advance climate action through resource recovery and reuse, energy optimization and biogas generation and clean energy generation, and industrial symbiosis in which Korea is a global leader. The US ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership is launching a Smart Cities Business Innovation Fund to promote net zero solutions to city challenges across sectors. The USC's the Brunei launched ASEAN Smart, um, excuse me, the ASEAN uh, Climate Change Center as a valuable opportunity to continue and expand upon such a, initiatives to promote innovation and to support national and subnational and city act act actors to make tangible progress towards climate action in the, in the Pacific region. And with that, thank you very much. And I welcome um, your questions and our discussion. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Santiago Fink. Uh, we now had our uh, prepared remarks from both of our experts. And so we can turn to the Q&A. Um, and we have a colleague with us, um, I gather from her uh, uh, you know, uh, input here in the Q&A section from the EU um, uh, Green Smart City Program uh, um, as the manager of that program. So um, I, because there's, there's a lot there, um, I, I, I wanna just leave it to you as the speakers and the experts to address some of those questions first or whichever ones you'd like to address. And then I have a couple of questions as well. Um, and so why don't we start with Sarah, would you like to respond to um, uh, uh, Ms. Van Emden's uh, remarks here, I believe. Um, there's, there's four comments and they range on topics. So perhaps you could you know, address the ones you think you're the best place to address. And same for Ms. Santiago Fink. I'm happy to um, address them. I just cannot, um, if maybe they can be read by somebody or oh, just- Oh, I see, you can't, okay, you don't have it. Okay, I, I, I apologize for that, I should have mentioned that. So the first comment from our colleague at the EU Green Smart City Program, uh, she's the manager there, I gather. Um, th there's been a surge of programs. So the basic question is, how can we avoid redundancy and ensure to have some kind of consistent approach amongst the Indo-Pacific partners uh, in order to leverage comparative advantages. So that's the first. Now, let me go on because it's related, I think, I, I, please forgive me for taking the liberty as the moderator to sort of put out a second one, which relates to this is, um, and that's China's role um, in terms of developing a, a low carb, you know, uh, better environmental standards, uh, clean industry technologies, et cetera. So the question here posed is, wouldn't that be better to focus more on ESG standard harmonization and localization across smart cities? Can we maybe take those first two questions raised by our colleague, and then we can go from there. Um, happy to. Um... Perhaps we should give the Miss um, Kim the first. Um... Yeah. Sarah, you'd like yeah. to give up? No, yeah, sure. Um, I guess in terms of the redundancy, that kind of uh, goes with the policy recommendation that I had is because this intercommunication domestically and also between the different external actors. Um, and drawing on that, there aren't as many um, 
cooperative projects that are going on between the US and ROK and other countries. But um, in building those forward, in order to avoid redundancy, I think it's important for the developed countries to first an analyze and see what kind of projects are being invested in the different cities that are in, um, in Southeast Asia. So avoiding too much funding, um, going into the same city and things like that, because one of the critical points that I mentioned is that the cities themselves have to seek for these um, fiscal resources. So us as the ones who are providing these um, resources, financial resources, I feel like it, it really, we really do have to see um, which cities are being uh, a bit neglected. I think that's a way going forward in terms of avoiding redundancy. Um, I don't know if Ms. Santiago Fink also has points to add to that same question. Um, yes, I'm happy to um, add to that. Um, my perspective is uh, in terms of redundancy, and I agree with you, there's a lot of donors, there's a lot of interest, and there's a lot of also um, not only governmental interest, but obviously business interest. Um, clearly, we know that the smart city sector is um, a growing sector. My perspective is that we need to take the lead from the ASEAN region and the ASEAN cities. The ASEAN cities know what they need um, mm. in large part. What are their urban challenges? And for that reason, we looked initially at the um, action plans that were, were developed by the um, ASEAN um, Smart Cities Network, the 26 that are in that group, but there's many other cities. And we are actually starting in our pro programming to work with other cities beyond those that are just in the Smart Cities Network. Um, that said, we also are looking in terms of what has the region as a whole prioritized as their challenges. And so recently developed this year um, was the regional action plan for marine debris. We know the issue of marine debris and waste management is a, ch is a challenge across the world and largely in the ASEAN region. The amount of plastic pollution generated um, in the region is tremendous. So we feel that we wanna take the lead in terms of what the region and what the cities are seeing. What are the greatest common denominators in terms of the need by cities? Um, so we looked at that. Um, we also take a look at assessments that have been done uh, for example, by the World Bank, by the ADB, and by other um, global institutions that are working much closely in the region. The issue of water also, wastewater. At most, only 30 to 40% of wastewater is treated in the region before it's deposited back into water bodies. So that is a challenge the, that the regional cities, the ASEAN cities are facing, and that the developed countries actually have um, more experience and higher technologies that could help support the ASEAN cities in this challenge. That may not be prioritized by them, but we know um, given some of the data and some of the work that's been done by more macro institutions that they'd add, that is also a challenge. So um, another idea in terms of dealing with the redundancy of cities, it would be interesting to have um, a working group among all the donors in the region and to establish that. Um, to see where we can actually come together. We've had started that conversation with our Japanese partners and just in terms of just sharing lists in mm. terms of what cities are you working in and what cities are we working in? Mm. And um, so that's a starting point and where are there commonalities um, there? Some of this infrastructure that is needed, particularly getting to the question in terms of looking at ESG harmonization was a very much um, uh, a good way to go. Clearly, as I mentioned, climate action and green economic recovery and circular economy, I see our priorities uh, very much in the region as well as globally uh, on a city perspective. We need to ensure that um, those issues are being addressed. And some of these are larger projects. They're much, they require much greater investment that any donor in and of itself can provide. Therefore, we need the cooperation to be able to look at um, the repurposing of materials, the creating of K water, the creating of new water like Singapore has done. These are multi-million dollar investments that very much need partnerships. Right, uh, well, thank you both. I'm, I'm gonna jump in here before returning to the Q&A because there's a couple of things that you both said that I just wanna sort of pull the thread on a little bit more. One is um, a better understanding of, because you know this 
this project that Sarah has so cleverly designed uh, for her research project under this US ROK Southeast Asia Visiting Fellowship Program. Obviously, um, there's an alliance component, right? Which is to sort of, you know, look for ways beyond the Korean Peninsula to engage US ROK collaboration in areas that best fit. Um, and so this alignment between the new Southern policy and the Indo-Pacific, fine. That's the chapeau, the, the overall framework. I guess my question is, um, it's a little sensitive perhaps, is, is there a competitive business element? Ms. Santiago Fink mentioned, you know, deploying business after all, at the end of the day, uh, with all due respect to the State Department and the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you know, they're not going to be the, the business uh, lead on providing data management services, ICT technology, software. Um, they're going to you know, provide the, the regulatory legal framework, policy framework, encourage coordination amongst bodies, all of that critically important work. But what's the balance between the competitive elements for Korean and American businesses and other businesses, surely Japanese companies, European companies, they want to get into these markets. They want to sell their technology, their 5G, their ICT, um, their service contracts to manage data, for example. So I'd like to know just a little bit more about how you see that you know, cooperation competitive element between the private sectors. So that's kind of my first question to both of you. And the second question relates um, to uh, this issue of uh, um, putting this in the China context. Um, and it's uh, raised here by Ms. Uh, Van Emden, the manager of the EU uh, Green Smart City uh, Program who asked questions earlier. You know, some people have suggested this be done in the Quad Critical and Emerging Technology Working Group, she notes, uh, as a result of a Center for New American Strategy. How competitive geopolitically or securitized uh, can this effort become or what kinds of things should we be careful of? Because one thing, as I understand, Sarah, from the, my reading of the New Southern Policy is it seeks to be more less sort of, you know, uh, in the geopolitical frame and more in the development and capacity building frame. So those are my two questions before we return back to the Q&A session. I guess if I uh, tackled the first question um, on the competitive business component, um, if I just go around that a little bit, a part of the reason why I started delving into this research was, um, I mean, South Korea has definitely stepped up its climate change mitigation efforts recently under the Moon administration. Um, but we can't really say that it's, it's a global leader in terms of climate change. Um, and because smart cities, they're so interwoven between climate change and technology business prospects. Of course, South Korea looks to export a lot of these technologies to the ASEAN and it already has been as in the case of the um, flood detection technologies and things like that. But I feel like it does need that US help assistance component in um, helping to weave these technologies into the climate change initiatives hmm. um, because it doesn't have those things set yet. Um, so as of now, I don't really see as much of a competition happening, more of a collaboration, um, hmm. especially with smart city efforts. Um, so that would be my answer to your first question. Um, maybe Santiago, Ms. Santiago Fink could also yes, add. Please. Uh, yes, um, clearly I, I see the opportunity. Um, competition is always good to create greater market choices for uh, the consumer. And I think this is what's important. And this addresses a little bit also the, um, the China question. At present, what we have in the region is we have a very big market and a very big producer, and clearly that is China. It actually, that the whole globe actually is dependent upon. Um, we saw that very much during the pandemic that supply chains were broken. And it's because so much of that is monopolized in the Chinese market. It behooves us globally 
um, cities in the US and cities in ASEAN and cities in Europe to be able to look at um, creating new markets and to strengthen supply chain development um, in this area, in this particular area, in the ASEAN region, we already have potential with Thailand, Malaysia that are actually expanding their productions. If during this time we can strengthen those countries and those cities, um, as well as many others, I only picked these two out because they already actually have uh, the potential to actually grow their markets, whether for products that are currently being produced in China and bringing greater production to these countries. It's the opportunity of working together in partnership with our partners that can provide the technologies for these countries in these cities to be able to grow and provide a new market. So I see it once again, I think competition breeds greater opportunities, it, it, it creates greater market choices. Uh, so one example is um, we're working clearly cybersecurity is very important um, in the whole smart city space. Um, we need to look at providing other choices of trusted infrastructure and trusted vendors for these cities in the ASEAN region to be able to go to as they're looking to develop um, their ICT infrastructure. And at the moment, there's really not too many choices. And so that's why it behooves other um, you know, uh, whether it's US, you know, ICT producers or whether it's Koreans or Japanese or Europeans or the Nordics to be able to be able to work in this market and to be able to provide more choices and more solutions to our ASEAN uh, city stakeholders. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you. Let me return to the Q&A. We have a question regarding Laos. So I'd like to raise that. Um, I, I, this, uh, it says here, what's written here, since I think you can't see, I worked for Green Sustainable Cities Development in Laos for a few years. I think it might include, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this, Pakse City, um, as well as helping Pakse City to develop Green City Action Plan. I wonder if either of you knew about that program or could say anything in response to the query raised uh, there by our, our, our listener. Pakse City in Laos. Did you know about any of the projects there? Um, I do not know um, very much about Laos. I am learning about it. We have uh, projects just in Vientiane right now that we've just started mm -hmm. with the water utility. Okay. Um, we are looking at um, Luang Prabang is another of the, um, the smart cities that form the ASEAN Smart Cities Network within Laos. And um, we are currently not working there, but um, this city, um, as well as other cities, um, can benefit from some of the work, some of the regional work that we're doing. The U.S. ASEAN Smart Cities Partnership is, is doing work specifically with certain cities in the mm -hmm. region, and then we're doing some work and we bring some of that knowledge at a regional level. Uh -huh. um, as we did when we launched, um, for example, the Integrated Urban Services Program, we did a, a regional launch in which any city in ASEAN could participate. Um, we will be doing more of that as our um, projects come to a level of maturity that we could share this knowledge with all the cities, whether they're part of the Smart Cities Network or not. And um, we welcome... Um, we welcome sharing information. Our website is being upgraded to the point that it will have an open access and source database that you can actually access the information and that'll be open to anyone. Thank you. Sarah, any comments on that? Otherwise I'll move to the next question. Yeah. Uh, I kind of had a comment to the China question. Oh, um, I beg your pardon, please. Oh, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> I thought you were done in your original response. Okay, please. No, no, no. Um, and I agree, it's, it's, it's a sensitive one, but um, recently I think South Korea, I mean, the whole, not the whole point, but a large part of the NSP was um, in light of this, you know, the supply chains and, um, diversifying supply chains in Southeast Asia as well. So, um, and re with the recent urea uh, happening in South Korea too, I feel like South Korea is more and more aware of that China overdominance factor, although it's always pursued this balancing strategy. So um, the whole point of NSP, I think, is you know, in consideration of the China factor as well. So I wanted to add that and then I wanted to ask Ms. Santiago Fink a question as well, if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely, Sarah. Because of the China thing, let me just ask, because it's come up in the chat here, another question has been laid into the chat, which directly okay. addresses your point 
And I, I just want to touch on it again, a kind of um, kind of what I was getting at and our, I think our European colleague, but uh, a colleague Han Wu Jung has written here in the chat section. Is there really any projects where the US and ROK could cooperate with China in ASEAN? I mean, there have been on and off um, efforts to look at any ways, any space to cooperate, or is that just on a, you know, very difficult to do both for ROK and the US? Or is there something where you know, different interests would align on something like environmental issues on a city project? Uh, that, that speaks directly to your issue of framing this within the China context and what the Santiago. Are there any cooperative elements there? I mean, you, you know, people do raise this question quite apart from strategic competition. Is there any functional cooperation in the areas of climate change, in the areas of environmental sustainability, where it makes sense to work with China? Please. Ms. Kim, do you want to answer that or I'm happy to answer it? Um, yeah, both. I'd love to. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll add my points afterwards. I believe there's, there's a lot of opportunity to cooperate with China. Um, China is clearly um, uh, very strong in many um, in sectors. In terms of climate change, they are a key crucial partner that we have to work with and we wish to work with. Um, they are a leader in solar. One of the opportunities, let me just give you just one of the many opportunities. Um, in terms of climate, in terms of where we have to go towards renewable energy, China is the world's global largest producer in terms of solar panels. We need to obviously um, move towards greater solar energy. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind is what happens to those solar panels when they're decommissioned after 15 or 20 or 25 years. There is going to be, and there already exists, a tremendous amount of e-waste, not only with our devices, but we're looking, if you talk about solar panel decommissioning, mm. this is something that we need to start addressing now. The, Vietnam has already started addressing it in terms of creating the enabling legislation to understand and to start planning for what do you do with the decommissioning of all these solar panels? Oh. There are tremendous uh, resources, rare earth resources in all our e-waste, as well as there will be in panels that can be repurposed upcycled and this is where korea is a leader korea is a leader in industrial symbiosis this is the types of technologies that we can work with in a collaborative manner with the japanese with the koreans with the chinese with the us and with many other countries that have the technologies that all of us need to come together and work towards we need really this multidisciplinary perspective. We need a very much of a collaborative perspective to address the challenges, not only the climate challenges that we have, but the biodiversity challenges we have and many other challenges that we have, not only in the region, but on a global scale. And so, yes, we can definitely work collaboratively with China. Thank you so much. Sarah, please, please. Uh-huh. And um, just kind of shifting away from Southeast Asia as well, China is also a great market for South Korea too, and these smart cities technologies, I believe too. So um, in looking at that, um, I feel like there is effort for cooperation there as well. Um, I know that I think Kotra like uh, presented some things at a Chinese conference and things like that. So in terms of that business connection, I feel like there's also an area of cooperation between China and South Korea. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have another question here from our colleague um, from the European program. Um, not much has been said about the announced US Smart Cities Business Fund so far. Could you elaborate a bit more on that? I, I guess maybe we'll start with Ms. Santiago Fink because this is more of a US Smart Cities Business Fund. So start there and then Sarah, please add your comments as you wish. Yes, happy to, um, and thank you for uh, highlighting that. Um, this is um, one of um, the new um, programs that we will be launching actually this month. Um, the genesis of this was that we saw that, and we know this is clearly nothing new, that cities always struggle with financing and to be able to um, tap those financial instruments. A lot of the instruments that Miss um, Kim mentioned and a lot of them that are out there often um, have to go through national governments. So we yeah. wanted to provide resources that cities can go directly. Um, and actually though, this fund is not specifically for cities. It is specifically targeting um, the other urban stakeholders. We are looking to catalyze um, startups um, or small businesses, nonprofits, 
and universities. And we would love to have uh, proposals from um, partnerships among these three. The, the requirement will be that it addresses an urban challenge that has already been documented by the city or by a university. So we are not funding cities, but we are funding urban city stakeholders that are supporting and finding solutions to urban challenges whether it's in Vientiane or whether it's in Phuket or wherever it may be. And so that's the purpose of this city, of this fund to be able, we're gonna be capitalized at $1 million um, as a start, as a pilot. And we hope that and it can grow from there with hopefully the support of, of other countries, other partners to be able to capitalize it to a much larger extent. But we wanna see what the demand is from ASEAN cities directly for them to propose the solutions to their urban challenges. I see. So it'll be an incoming request, and then uh, you know, uh, uh, assessed within the fund to look at which project proposals are best to pursue. Exactly. It will be future. demand driven from the yeah. ASEAN cities. We want solutions from the ASEAN cities Correct. that we can support. Oh, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, Ms. Kim, um, any comments? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to add on to um, what Ms. Santiago Fink said about startups, um, which I think is very important. And South Korea, I think, is also very invested in helping startups grow in Southeast Asia. And it's one thing to export ready-made technologies, but um, helping to uh, nurture startups in Southeast Asia is really important because it helps with trust building mm -hmm. and it helps monitor what kind of technologies are flowing in um, to Southeast Asia as well from the early stages. So as Southeast Asia also, such as countries like Vietnam, I mean, they're already manufacturing high technology goods um, and they're looking to, you know, uh, gain more knowledge about developing these on their own. So helping to do that from the early stages, I think is very critical. And South Korea has been um, emphasizing the need to assist startups in Southeast Asia. Um, recently as well. Well, wonderful. I don't see any more questions in the chat or the Q&A at this moment. I, I do have one question maybe before we close and it just really betrays my lack of understanding of, of the smart cities issue. But please, uh, if you would be so kind as to just offer any comment. You know, one reads one about new cities being built sort of from the ground up, new cities develop. I mean, I think there's a plan for Jakarta, for example, to move the capital. Um, mm -hmm. In your guys' expertise and the work that you're doing on this topic, um, you know, what's the optimum way to proceed? Is it to, you know, retrofit existing long standing cities with upgraded smart efforts? You know, I, you know I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of cities are well established and, and in Southeast Asia. And, and can you sort of, modernize those or is it sometimes better just to, if you will, build a new city uh, that, you know, whether it's adjacent or, you know, nearby or whatever, and just start with all the new technology now. Um, and, and, and particularly, I'm kind of interested in Ms. Santiago Fink because you're working on this with the governments in the region. What do Southeast Asians prefer? Do they, do they you know, want to, do they want to fix current cities or do they just want to build new cities for internal drivers that they have and, and national plans that they have? Please. Um, Ms. Kim, do you want to answer this or, or, or is the question posed to me? No, to both of you. Okay. I mean, what have you, what have you picked up from your work on Southeast Asia? What do they want? Which one? I'm, ha I'm happy to answer, but Ms. Kim, why don't you please go first? Oh. Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, um, but uh, I think um, tying this in with what I found with data management, um, I feel like a lot of cities are developing uh, visualization techniques hmm. to run through the pros and cons of um, what how the city would work after it's built and things like that. So those technologies could help, you know, do the cost analysis before deciding to just wreck a whole city and build a new one. So that that was kind of my thought at it because I, I did da data management focused research, but um, I'm sure Ms. Santiago Fink actually has hands-on experience talking with Southeast Asian counterparts. So I'm so eager to hear about <laughs> what she thinks. No, but that's a, 
that's a very useful comment, Sarah, to, to know that this issue of they're doing visualizations to decide which may be the best effective way. Ret I'm just using these words because I don't you know, know the technical word. Retrofit an existing city or just build a new city. And they can do that through sort of deciding what the costs and other implications are. Ms. Fink. Uh, Ms. Santiago, Sure, that's the beauty of technology that we can actually do these forecasts beforehand. But this is the question, do we do brown fields or green fields? Right. And honestly, as a climate urbanist, I would prefer the brown fields, but uh, there are often reasons to do green fields. And that's why uh, Jakarta, since it's suffering from subsidence and it's actually sinking and it has a lot of other problems, uh, the country is looking to move its capital to um, uh, Borneo. And right. um, and that project is uh, will be a, a clearly green, massive greenfield project. But it's really um, there are many reasons uh, to consider uh, either a brown field or a greenfield strategy, um, and 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 they're complex and they're multifaceted. And there's just not one reason. Some mm -hmm. of them are geopolitical. Some of them are because of environmental issues. Some of them are because of um, other challenges in terms of um, demographics, in terms of migration issues. There are, the Europeans have some good examples in terms of cities that have been retrofitted, that have actually worked with cities that have already been there and they've built um, elements that are new, they've brought in technology, they've brought in um, uh, sustainable um, uh, green design, um, they brought in new materials to be able to do, um, you know, a, a much more, um, in a sense, smart, sustainable city building upon what was already there. We have seen some of the new um, examples that have been done, for example, by the, um, the United Arab Emirates, like the city of Mazdar, which was a, a total greenfield and a total technological city. That city has not been very successful or did not meet its fair forecasts. Um, and so there are examples of where you start anew and has not really reached um, that level of um, expectations. A city it needs to be organic because it's not all about, it's not just about layering technology and doing buildings and doing these great, beautiful buildings. It's you want the people, the culture, the traditions to actually be there. That is what makes the life of a city. Going back to uh, Jane Jacobs literature in terms of what really makes it our city. And that is often mm -hmm. grown organically by different ebbs and flows of demographics and changes. What mm -hmm. we need to be conscious of is we need to make sure, and there is no really excuse um, today that any building that we do needs to be done in a net zero or low carbon development. Any infrastructure that we invest in needs to be green, needs to embrace renewable energy, needs to be a more compact urban development so we mitigate urban sprawl. We don't want the dependency on the automobile, but we want to provide cities with mobility choices, um, whether they be light rail, metro, or um, BRT systems. So any infrastructure investment, whether it's a green field or a brown field, needs to be low carbon and ideally net zero in order to create a more equitable, a more resilient and a more sustainable quality of life. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, uh, Ms. Sarah Kim, um, our visiting fellow under the US-Korea Cooperation on Southeast Asia program, very generously funded by the Korea Foundation. We thank you for your excellent work and, and staying up late there in Seoul, um, uh, Sarah, thank you. And to Ms. Helen Santiago Fink of the US State Department ASEAN Smart Cities Program, we thank you very much for taking the time and sharing your expertise and insights with us as well. And for all of those who joined us, Happy New Year for our first program of 2022. And just a quick reminder, uh, and um, Ms. Sarah Wong will put in the uh, chat the link to the, uh, some programs that are coming up. In this series, as I mentioned, on January 6th, that's Thursday morning, that's tomorrow morning, um, US ROK Cooperation to Improve Intellectual Property Protection in Southeast Asia with our visiting fellow, Mr. Seth Hayes, um, and two commentators, one from Southeast Asia and one from the Embassy of the Republic of Korea here in Washington, D.C., and then on the 11th of January, 8.30 in the morning, East Coast time, we have exploring trilateral cooperation possibilities between the US, Korea, 
and the Philippines with our Southeast Asian visiting fellow, Mr. Julio Amador. And so we have a really rich program and then we have additional programs, not necessarily in this series coming up. So I hope if you're not on our mailing list or on our webinar uh, events invite list, you will consider doing so. We have a number of fascinating programs coming up with such experts and uh, officials. So thank you again for joining us. Good day to everyone. Happy New Year. Wishing you health and happiness. Thank you from the East West Center in Washington.